Classical musicians always talk about interpretation. We don't just play a piece, we interpret it. We don't just have a favorite recording. Instead, we prefer one person's interpretation over another person's interpretation. But why do we use this word? We're all familiar with the concept of interpreters being used to translate for two people speaking different languages. But there's an important distinction between translation and interpretation. You see, in translation, you're taking one literal definition in one language and coming up with the equivalent definition in the second language. But if any of you have tried to use Google Translate before, you know that sometimes this process can go pretty drastically wrong. That's because literal definitions don't always have the same meaning when they're strung together into sentences. Interpretation goes a step further than translation and explains not just the word-for-word -word definitions, but should get to the heart of the meaning and the context of the language. Now in music, the same basic principles apply, namely that we don't just want to translate the written music off the page and turn them into sound waves. Computers can do that if you just turn the sheet music into MIDI. Instead, we try to create shapes with the music. We try to color and shade the sound to convey some sense of a larger narrative or structure or symbolism that the audience can relate to. One of the amazing things about classical music is that you can take 10 different performers, give them the exact same written manuscript, and come up with 10 very different sounding interpretations. But then how do we come up with our own convincing interpretations that people can actually relate to? From the time that I was in high school through my undergrad years, there was this sort of generally accepted principle of interpretation that I was taught and it goes something like this. Don't listen to too many recordings of a piece that you're working on, especially as it gets closer and closer to the time of a performance or recording, or else your interpretation will be affected by the other players. Now, for years, I took this advice for granted, because after all, it sounds quite reasonable. Every artist wants their individuality to shine through in the work. So I accepted this advice without question. I'd listen to a few recordings of the piece at first, and then I'd stop listening to the recordings after I began working on it. And I definitely stopped listening to the recordings of that piece as it got closer to when I had to perform. Now, it wasn't until my master's degree that my piano professor challenged this notion in an unexpected way. I don't even remember what piece I was working on in my lesson, but she stopped me and she told me that my interpretation was very out of style for that particular time period or composer. So she asked me, whose recordings have you listened to? And I told her, I think uh, I remember Galel's and some other pianists. And then she asked me how recently I had listened, and I said, it's been quite a while. And of course, she asked me why, and I gave her the reason I was always given, that I didn't want their interpretations to affect my interpretation too much. And to my surprise, she just laughed and said, why don't you want to sound like Galel's? If you came in and played like Galel's, I would be jumping for joy. But even if you tried to sound exactly like him, you couldn't do it because you're not him. Now that made a lot of sense and that lesson never left me. She told me that I needed to be listening to more, not fewer great recordings and even further analyzing the way that they were performed. And her reasoning was something along the lines of, how are you supposed to have a legitimate interpretation unless you are very familiar with the style? And how will you be very familiar with the style unless you listen to many, many recordings over and over and you analyze the heck out of them. She went so far as to suggest that I try playing along with the recordings wearing headphones, trying to match their articulations or their tempo or their phrasing, or especially the rubato. And now it's something I actually suggest to my own students. If you want to have like an amazing masterclass in rubato, try playing some slow movements along with Vladimir Horowitz or Arthur Rubinstein and see if you can actually match their timing. As far as the fear that I would lose my individuality from this study, actually the opposite thing began to happen because I would become so familiar with their interpretations that a particular phrase would bother me or the way that they accented a certain chord or the way that they accelerated through a certain passage or maybe missed a note or two here. But at the same time, my variety of sound improved my sense of rubato improved and everything about my playing and understanding of the style of the music improved. I began to learn to create a synthesis of their ideas of many different recordings and create my own individual take on the work. It's interesting that this view still persists frequently throughout many parts of the world, 
that you shouldn't listen to too many recordings. In art, it used to be common for art students to go to museums and try to copy the great masterpieces, although I've heard that particular tradition is dying away for some reason. Actors study people's mannerisms in very, very closely, trying to mimic and take on a particular role. You know, athletes will study slow motion, their favorite athletes trying to understand the way that they move. And it's interesting that musicians are kind of discouraged from this careful analysis. Anyways, it's just a thought of mine. I encourage you guys to actually try this exercise and try playing along with a recording, especially those slow movements. And I'd be very surprised if you didn't actually end up learning a lot from that experience.